Okay, thank you. Uh, I thought we would just start with the question. Um, everybody kind of gives their biography, where they were born, their early training, as it might relate to your life as an artist, up through the college level. And what I thought is that each time we would start with somebody new. So I thought we would start with Senga. And uh, unless she doesn't want to be the first one to go with that, I will start with and, somebody and else. And I have a question also because uh, you said up to college. Well, through, through college, college, through okay. college, okay. through. So it's like all your training right. as a from a baby oh. to twenty three okay. in fifteen minutes oh. <laughs> <laughs> or ten. <laughs> Mary, you want to start instead of saying she's she's ceding her minutes to you, her first minutes. <laughs> um, start there. Um, okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't mind starting in first. Why don't you say your whole name, where you were born? Um, Marin Louise Jenkins Hassinger. Uh, I was born in 1947, uh, June 16th, at uh, Queen of Angels Hospital in Los Angeles. Uh, my mother is Helen Mills Jenkins, my father, Carrie Kenneth Jenkins, and he was an architect and she worked with the um, um, LA, LA City School District most of her life. Although in the beginning, she was a policewoman and she worked mostly on juvenile detail down in the South Central area. Um, and um, before that, she worked with children and uh, teens in playground. My mother went to LA High and I went to LA High. Um, let's see, before LA High, there was Wilton Place Elementary School on uh, Wilton Place, I believe it's on 8th Street. Um, let's see, then the next thing was John Burroughs uh, Junior High School, which is on Wilshire near McCadden, and uh, then LA High on Olympic and Bryn Paul. And then um, Bennington College, Bennington, Vermont. And after Bennington College, I returned to LA and started graduate study at UCLA. And I was there from 1970 to 73. That I got an MFA in fiber structure. And my mentor there was Bernard Kester, who I am still quite Anyway. My mentor at um, Bennington College was Isaac Whitkin, and um, I just thought you know it was quite interesting. Um, he was the first one who told me that really my sculptures were um, were good and um, worthy of continuing, and he gave me a lot of encouragement. And he was a white South African; he had been born in South Africa, so I always thought that was kind of ironic. Um, okay. He had been, however, I have to say, he immigrated to England and went to um, and and uh, went to um, oh boy, the London <coughs> Art School. His name is escaping me right now. Slim? St. Martin's. Oh, and um, so he was a part of a young group in the '60s when I was at Bennington, and he was my teacher. That. Um, were very hot at the time. They had, you know, a lot of substance in New York. Um, when he was on sabbatical one time, um, the job was taken over by Mike Todd, who actually uh, was a Los Angeles sculptor. And when I moved back to LA, I, I saw him a few times, and I've lost track of him since. Of course, this is all in the ancient ages. I got uh, my uh, BA in 1969 from Bennington and the MFA from 1973 here in, at UCLA. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Were you finished? I think that's enough. That's oh, yeah, education wise. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you about Clement Greenberg at Bennington mm -hmm. while you were there because, oh, yeah. of course, this is kind of his twilight moment right. at Bennington. Right. Um, and I read somewhere uh, that he was around in one of your crits or he was around right. during the time right. when you yeah. were there. Yeah, he uh, carried a big stick. 
Yeah, the faculty was fairly intimidated by him because um, he was the big selector. You know, he was the gatekeeper at the time. And so a lot of them didn't make the grade, according to him, and were on the outs. And so everybody treated him with a lot of death. Who was the painting faculty there at that point? Was well, when I was the closest to, to Paul Feely was my initial advisor when I came. And, um, but I, I don't know if he was there when I left in 69. He might have passed away. I'm not really sure about the dates on that. But uh, Pat Adams was my big um, support um, there. And she didn't get the okay from Greenberg. Um, did you have interactions with him? Yes, he did. He was at my final crib. And he did talk about my work. And I do remember what he said. You have to watch out for that. Meaning it was looking a little too Carol esque or something. Okay. You know? Um, but I mean, it's hard to take the guy seriously when I saw the damage he was doing to some of the faculty. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just too almighty, too powerful. But it should have been a great lesson, and this is how it works. You know, uh, I think maybe now I understand a lot better than I did then. Then I was in, my, in the middle of it, and I was immature, and then I've lived a life of it. And um, so it's a different, you know, a really different perspective now. He's a very bright guy, you know. Um, he himself, I saw his paintings, they were very romantic landscapes, straight out of impressions, unbelievably so. Very nostalgic and romantic. Um, as far as the painting faculty, that question you asked, it was. Um, Larry Coombs and um, at one point Ken Nolan and, and Julie Lewis. As it turns out now, in Baltimore where I'm living now, I live around the corner from Michael Michael Freed. And Michael Freed <laughs> was Greenberg's um, right. protege, protege yeah. extraordinaire. And he teaches at Hopkins in Baltimore. So I invited him to talk to my graduate students, and he came along and uh, he talked about photography, which is a, his real interest now. But I gave him a ride home, and he invited me in, and he has all those people in his house. Uh -huh. He's got a Caro's everywhere, and Larry Cruz's, and Olympsies, and no one. And it was like a flashback to that moment. Yeah. Now, why did you choose Bennington? What was the draw of Bennington for you? At somebody from Los Angeles? Oh. To, to go all the way to Vermont to the freezing cold from right. there. Well, they had a wonderful catalog and it said, no grades and two choices. <laughs> and the magic word, no grades. <laughs> so that's how I ended up there. And weirdly, my roommate was the woman I had grown up with who lived across the street from me, Michelle Maddox. So for a year we were roommates, then she left and I remained. I'm happy I stayed. I went back to visit uh, in June and show some oh, slides to oh, good. students, and Pat Adams came to the talk. And I dedicated it to the memory of Isaac, who's now gone to his reward. And um, um, it just didn't look the same to me. The whole place seemed all entirely different. Was dance a draw? Yeah. Was dance a draw for you? I mean, it wasn't yeah, that was the, the original. original. <laughs> that was the original draw. The original draw was I was going to be this, you know, uh, second coming of Martha Graham. Or something. Woo! All right. Um, and um, I got there and I started taking classes and I was really un solely unprepared compared to the other students. Sort of unprepared. And um, and who was who were you taking classes with? Um, was Judy Dunn there? She was there, but that was later, not the okay. first year. Um, Martha? Martha Whitman was there. She couldn't. Mm, she didn't. Jack. Jack, Jack Moore. Jack, Jack Moore. Moore. Right. Jack Moore's classes, I still remember all that foot padding, <laughs> turn this way, turn that way, fall over, stand up. And it was just so different than the Horton technique that I had been studying here in LA. It was very. Um, um, well, I, Merce Cunningham were kind of post-Graham mm -hmm. stuff that I was really um, 
it was very non-emotional uh, and very tricky combinations, which I could never get front turn, back turn. You know, you're, I, saying, you're saying Jax was Jax was, was not, and I would leave those classes in tears. I just couldn't do it. You know, yeah, yeah. and um, and then I had a counselor who was Martha Whitman's husband, who was the musicologist for the dance department. And he just came out and told me, well, I think you're better in sculpture than you are in dance. And it was really <laughs> devastating. Because it meant that they weren't going to let me be a dance major. Uh, and I took, you know, I took the easy route, I guess you could say. I said, OK, fine. I'll do the sculpture. And then I just kept doing the sculpture. And I still do the dance. Like I was in a dance class last night. Do you, but do you think, um, sorry to Bogarting, but anybody can really jump in. Just oh, yeah. Kelly, shut up. Jump, jump but, in. <laughs> but, um, do you think that, do you feel that you were really unprepared, or do you really feel that it was the, uh, the type of place, because of the focus on ballet, or modern, and ballet, in a certain kind of body, in a certain mm -hmm. kind of what they expected from what the dance body was, who the dancer really should be, yeah, well, that it in the end it, it ends up being racist, whether or not they say, right. you know, we only want white dancers. They're right. not going to say that. But yeah. do you do you feel? I mean, the fact that you say you were crying at the end of it, or do you just think it's this is what happens to a lot of young women who try to take dance and they weed them out this way? Mm -hmm. Do you feel that there was some well, kind of thing like that? Uh, yeah, it was kind of a little bit of everything, I think. But one of the main things is that Bennington, even though no grades and choose your own classes, very conservative extremely, you know, blinders as to what is in the academy and what isn't, whether it was art, literature, or dance. And so I found out that the women that I was with in dance class had gone to dance classes five days a week for 10 years. Okay, so there was a real big technical difference. And I did, I really am not naturally that limber or naturally that I don't have a kinesthetic memory like some people naturally have. So it was going to be harder to train me. That was the other thing. And as far as the bodies are concerned, they were a little more liberal about the bodies because there were several women who were hippie or you know, a little overweight or whatever, uh, or weren't you know, particularly gorgeous or something like that. So that wasn't the issue. The issue was I really wasn't trainable. I wasn't up to their standard. So I had a technical problem. And. Um, you know, there were other uh, African Americans who were actually in the dance area who did who were majors, mm -hmm. and they were technically more deft. Not women. They were women, yeah. yes, okay. and there were men also because right. Ulysses Dove was there. Was right. Wow. Yeah. Right. But but that's the other thing. I mean, men, the, you, black men have mm -hmm. a kind of. I don't want to say an easier time, but I think there is a certain kind of aesthetic on black women's bodies mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. dance, whether it's modern ballet, yeah. that black women cannot ever achieve that right. ideal. Whereas there are always need, there's always a need for black male body or male bodies in right. the dance, right. and so that there's a different kind of criteria. Not to say that it's less, but I'm right. just saying it's just different. Right. That's why I'm saying was it men, women? Yeah. There were black women who were um. who were dancing, who were graduating, mm -hmm. besides Dove. Yeah, yeah there was and another guy, uh, Harry Shepard, who was there. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> um, well, Brenda Kidd was, was somebody in my class who was from Philly. Uh, and she was African American, and she majored in dance. Um, but she had more of a classic, thin, white mm -hmm. dancer's body, and she was technically you know, with it all. Mm -hmm. um, Joanna Robinson. I think she split her major with psychology and dance or something like that. And um, she was less technically adept in the dance and definitely African American. Um, very beautiful mm -hmm. woman. Um, was Daria Vaughn there when you were there? Daria Vaughn? I don't know. Probably not. Maybe not. Yeah. Um, what about your own dance training? Leading up to Bennington, oh, okay. what kind of training did you have? Yeah, that's really uh, important here and interesting because Sang and I had the same teachers. Really? Some of the same teachers. We didn't know it at the time. And we didn't know it at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. um, well, they, 
when I was very young, when I was five years old, and I didn't even have a leotard in tights. I remember this. I had a little sundress I wore to class. <laughs> and it was with Anne and Paul Barlin, who later became quite well known for, um, um, I think they, they or at least Anne wrote books on early ch childhood dance training. And she had what she called her creative dance. And I remember at the end of each class, they would pile up a couple of phone books in the center of the floor, and then we had to run on a diagonal and leap over these phone books. That was like the end of class. So much fun, and I just fell in love with dance because of that. Mm -hmm. But that turned out, by the time I got to Bennington, it's not what dance was really about. It wasn't the joy of <laughs> jumping and running. It was very much more complicated than that, you know, mm -hmm. or at least for me. You say you started at five. How yeah. long did you stay with them? And, um, but still, it was only like once a week, maybe twice a week if we were rehearsing for something. It was never that kind of New York hardcore, you know, ballet bar every day. You know, it was, it was never like that. It was always fun and joyous. And it was the, um, it was like the one really physical thing I did. Um, so was that I was not a good sports person. You know, I didn't have this fearful ball. Was that all throughout your childhood? From five on? Oh no, it lasts, that lasted maybe from like five to eight, let's say, and then there was a break, and then maybe around 10 or 11, I got back in with the Horton people, mm -hmm. and it was Lelia Goldoni, and, um, oh Lord, De La Vallade, uh, Yvonne. Yvonne De La Vallade. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and so they worked as a team, and then that was like maybe 11 to at least 16 or 17, maybe even 18, and then after that, then I went to Bennington. And Lelia, who was this magnificent dancer, absolutely magnificent dancer, was also an actress, you know, LA people, you know how they do. She was in Shadows. She was absolutely yeah. in Faces. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. So she became a Casavetti's mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. But um, before that, she'd been a Horton person. So uh, she said to me, she said, oh my God, you know, I've worked for the craziest people in the world. Um, and um, she said, uh, Horton was about to design a dance especially for her, a choreographed dance especially for her, and then he passed away. So um, that was kind of the end of things as far as her professional dance career. And then she and Yvonne got together and we were teaching the technique. And of course, I still remember parts of the technique. Do you remember dimensional tonus? If you show it to me. They ended up like this. Uh, and I don't remember that. I remember the you know, contract and release. Oh, yeah. Contract. Right. <laughs> and the side swings and the oh, yeah, and tossing your body down. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. I'm curious, how did you happen to get into these particular classes? I mean, you were interested in dance. Did the Barlin people steer you this way? Did no. you hear about? Yeah, I heard about it some kind of way. I don't know. The, you know, the De La Vallade sisters and Horton, they were classic dance in L.A., you know. And Horton was especially important because he included a lot of Eastern ideas, you know, like um, like yogic ideas, really. And um, much as Graham was doing, but he wasn't associated with her. He was totally West Coast phenomenon. And then a lot of Native American things. And his company was the first integrated company, you know. And he produced, um, you know, the guy in New York. Alvin Ailey. Alvin Ailey. Yeah. He produced Alvin Ailey. Lelia, the De La Vallades, James, James Truitt, and who else were all in his company. Wow. Yeah. There were others I just didn't know. Except James Truitt. We may not just call him James Truitt. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you really call him. No, see, I didn't actually oh, take from yeah. him. <laughs> James Truitt. <laughs> and I was shocked when I heard his name later as James Truitt. <laughs> Oh, 
Carrie met, went to, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. Jane Cortez. Uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Horace, yeah. and Horace, you know, Chad Scott, and his, uh, just a slew of people. My father went there, too. Did he? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. It was like the premier black high school in Los Angeles, because because Los Angeles was so, you know, so segregated, you know, there was almost certain places where um, African American would go to school anyway, and we lived in that area, and so, um, Jefferson High School wound up being in just this place where we had this, you know, repository of all kinds of talent, and we had very dedicated you know, instructors, including Mr. Brown, who, you know, taught music. But then you have, um, and this is going a little bit off, but you have William Grant Still who would come and visit his class, you have uh, W.C. Henry who would come and visit his class, and, you know, and his classes basically were geared around, you know, music, because a lot of the kids were not motivated in any other way, so the, the school allowed him to you know, teach music all the way to the students who attend. And it wanted to be like a conservatory. Wow. You know, and it was all like, but anyway, it's a little bit different. But, it, but that's one of the things that he mentions that um, you know, the library and also there were some offices who also had, who had gone there. I don't I, I didn't hear you. And also, uh, oh, oh, oh. Who so. go there who, and I don't know that area. But Jefferson High School, I think, was a beginning place for a lot of people. It seems like parents didn't mention it. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering where the place was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about it. Where, 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 yeah, where was it located? Uh, and then uh, what? Uh, Jefferson's located Central. near Central Avenue. Right. Yeah, not too far from Central Avenue. So, 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 huh. so, so that's where all the music kind of ties in, I think, too. Yeah, uh, because a lot of those, those people mm -hmm. would come and visit Mr. Brown's class, and so the students got a chance to, you know, to see what was going on, you know, um, on a close up kind of like, you know, way that they would not. Well, they, but they all hung out on Central Avenue. Just peek in to see what was going on, mm -hmm. you know, because it was there. You know, it was, you know, it was you know, everything that happened musically in, in LA around the, 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 the let's say, the end of the 30s, 40s, and 50s was right there. You know, so it's not, you know, um, I would think unusual for um, other artists to come on, you know, Jefferson High School. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that was definitely a, a large locale for the community. In, in terms of the, uh, the music scene in particular. Mm -hmm. Did your mother go there? My mother went to school in New Orleans. I believe from New Orleans. Oh. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask Marin one more question, and then maybe, Barbara, do you want to start with your bio after this question? Would you be comfortable with being yeah. the next person? Mm -hmm. um, your dad's architecture studio, where was it located, and do you think that his uh, architectural uh, Jeans. Background. Jeans. <laughs> Got into you with these yeah. later with these big right. metal things right. that now you're not yeah. doing it anymore. Well, my father was very successful. I mean, he, you know, as successful as the other people you're mentioning in the music field. My father was that way with architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, last night I passed by his old office, which is on the pier in Wilshire, in Beverly Hills. So he did quite well. What was his name again? Carrie K. Jenkins. And that was the name of the company? Yeah. And he, one of his biggest projects that he did was Martin Luther King Hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. so he did mostly public work. He did a few private homes, um, but it was mostly public work. Was he the same generation as Paul Williams? Same no, that was his, more like his mentor. mentor. Right. Okay. He okay. was the next generation. Okay. He uh, was born in 1919. Okay. Right, right. Well, he was born at the end. Uh, but do you think, what about the influence? None? Oh, total influence, but he denied it. Okay, but what about you? I do not deny it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a drafting table in the dining room when I was a child. Wow. And um, there was his op various offices that I always went to and checked out everything. And um, like, uh, when I was on a work term for Bennington, one of the years I worked in his office, and one of the guys there, Ted Tanaka, designed, you know, the at LAX, that entrance yeah. with those poles that right. light up at right. night? That was, that's Ted Tanaka's piece. Oh. So, I mean, I, I just think that all of it, like, kind of works together as a whole. And I wouldn't have done well being a businesswoman and an architect. That would not have. <laughs> but my father, you know, had various problems which um, are too numerous now to really go into, but one of the main things is his family came from Louisiana, mm -hmm. and he was uh, a 
in quotes, adopted out of his um, biological family. However, in the research that I did, he wasn't really adopted. He was just taken to Los Angeles, supposedly on a vacation with these people, mm -hmm. and they never let him go. Wow. So uh, he has a whole family background that's like impossible. But as I did the research for it, I realized it was not so atypical of that generation to have been so badly affected by the aftermath of slavery to have done like really peculiar things. Mm -hmm. And so he was still like recovering from all of that uh, when, you know, when I was born. And he hadn't recovered from it. He was never recovered from it. It was a terrible thing that led to a lot of disease and unhappiness. And, and in fact, my son, uh, and this would be the end of this. <laughs> it's starting to ramble. My son um, is starting college this year. So last year he was doing all the application process, right? And I said, well, I'll help you, I'll help you. But then he said, no, I'll do it myself. So he did the whole thing, you know? He got accepted to all these colleges. He got in Yale, he got in Harvard, he got in Georgetown, he got in all of these places. So I said, wow, you know, wow. And then I heard what he sent. He sent the story of my father's life and the fact that my father's maternal grandfather was lynched. And that, I think, that's the story got him in I mean, he had good grades and all, but I mean, right. that did it. That sewed it up. Wow. Yeah. So from this kid at Jefferson, who had this very dysfunctional family, through my son, who's now entering Yale. You know. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Congratulations. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, well, Barbara, let's now jump to you um, up with you know your biography. Where were you born? Up through you know college, grad, and school, and all that. Okay. Well, I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, in 1945. I'm the daughter of Seymour Al. My mother's father had been a pastry chef. My mother's uncles had been pastry chefs. 
how I remember my, my father and his brothers were all musicians, and they were Dixie um, traditional jazz musicians, which are called Dixie musicians. So we had music around our life, my family, you know, like always. Um, either my uncles and then my father, um, because he was blind, he would go to the service and he'd come out and he was blind. He spent years in the hospital dealing with his blindness, and uh, he, he had you know, decided that he would take to try to live a lot of blind he was a musician. He uh, was a secretary of the Musicians Union in New Orleans. And in New Orleans, you have a segregated, segregated union. You have a white union and then you have a black union. So we would go to you know, things. Because my father was blind, he would take us to different activities that were associated with the Musicians Union. So even though we were very young, my sister and I, we would periodically go to recording sessions. We would go to, uh, which was very scary then for me, go to Musicians Union. Where you had all these men hanging out, waiting to be chosen to be, you know, um, you know, signed in for whoever was recording for the day, and it was um, everything was makeshift. It was like really, it was interesting because the recording studio uh, where a lot of the early rock and roll um, uh, recordings took place was like in the back of a furniture store, mm -hmm. and then you had all these black guys standing out, you know, waiting. You know, here I was with my dad. Scared to death, you know, <laughs> not understanding really what was going on. Hmm. Well, then we, you know, my father would, you know, you know talk to people down there, and he would, you know, go to the actual place where the quarters would go around. So I got to see little Richard, or, you know, mm -hmm. people like that who, you know, who were recording. And it was very, very, you know, very scary because I didn't know what this world was. I didn't know why all these men were just standing around, and, you know, and they were very nice and very, you know, very kind, you know, to, to me, but he would still sort of like, you know, since I didn't really understand it all. Mm -hmm. And how, how old were you at this I point? I think I must have been probably around between eight and, you know, about eight and nine mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, later on we called ourselves, we were our dad's C&I dolls. You know? <laughs> 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 he was uh, something else. <laughs> he was really something else. But, uh, so, you know, he, um, then he wound up, uh, uh, and this was all interesting for, for the kids in the family because he wound up being the manager of a, of a guy named Clarence Frogman Henry. <laughs> okay. So he was his manager, and then my parents had to go away for a while. So my sister and I and my brother, we were, we were basically you know, at home when they did this, and they did what was called the chicken circuit. You know? So they went to all those clubs and played the Apollo, and they you know, brought back all these really great things for us to take a look at. And, you know, they got to see Frankie Warren and the team names, and you know, Mickey and Sophie and all those folks. And then it came to a point where I think because of um, my father's vivaciousness in terms of taking the steps that he had as a you know, African American man, you know, exerting managerial you know, control over this person, um, all the powers that be didn't really go with that. So a lot of you really left <laughs> when we left New Orleans and we came you know, to Los Angeles. Um, and that was very different kind of because we were used to being around a lot of people. We were used to being around people who were warning, regardless of whether or not it was a segregated society or not. When they saw you, they said, you know, are you supposed to say good morning, good afternoon, you know, whatever. And we had people here, you know, oh, this was in 1957. People didn't speak here. You know? mm -hmm. um, there was not this camaraderie in the neighborhoods that we were used to. And we would eat, my sister and my brother and I would be, um, for the longest time, the oldest kids in the only kids in the so there was no one you know, to really you know, communicate with, to exchange, you know, to play with. And so we just terrorized each other. <laughs> Much to my mother's, you know, discomfort. But we just basically had no one to communicate with. Um, and leaving the New Orleans experience, it's like we didn't have Mardi Gras to look forward to. Mm -hmm. We didn't have, you know, what color. I mean, New Orleans was a very colorful place to grow up. Mm -hmm. I mean, vivid colors all the time. And it was like, you know, music all the time. And I didn't really get to see you know, you know, the other arts, but music was very, you know, predominant there. And it was very much, you know, um, part of the livelihood of you know, in that family. So when we came here, my father's life really changed. You know, it changed completely because he could barely play music, because it was just a different world. Um, by the time we got here, what had happened was the musician team had joined. So in the process of the 
was you know, getting into segregation, um, the properties that were part of the black communities were absorbed you know, by the white community. And I think that even happened here in Los Angeles too. So it was, you know, it was a really, really difficult you know, time because when you, you know, were identified as having certain skills and certain talents, and all of a sudden you came from this pool that maybe you had no longer got the attention that you really should have, you know, given the skill sets and you know, the talent that you had. So we came here, it was totally and completely a different experience. Um, um, I went to Mission Family Memorial High School. And Don't you so say it? <laughs> 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 the girls. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. We did that girls. was Woo. after my time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> okay. The Fisher County Memorial High School was a very interesting place because you were in, well, when I went there, it was very, it was, it was integrated. And then you well, had a certain percentage of white students, a certain percentage of Latino students, a certain percentage of black students and then you had a spring middle of um, Asian students. Okay. Very strict environment. I mean, you could get, you know, kicked out of school for chewing, putting your gum on, you know, the bottom of your desk. I mean, that's how, you know, how really strict it was. Mm -hmm. You were, you know, very early you were classified as to whether or not you had the potential of going to college mm -hmm. or not. You know, so you were geared even to college prep courses. So other other girls, I mean, had that potential that were not early on recognized that were not you know, put in courses that would allow them to basically you know, be prepared to go to college. So that was, you know, that was you know, very limiting. So you wound up having like, very few African American you know, girls in your classes. I think there was like four or five of us all together in, in one of my classes. Um, Kennedy provided a very good foundation you know, academically, I feel, uh, but it did not allow you a way to express who you were as an individual. As a matter of fact, it was suppressed, really suppressed. And a lot of that came out by what they called it the senior apologetics, where you basically had classes where you were supposed to defend the faith. And anyone who basically had you know, any, any thoughts that might have been a little bit you know, outside of what doctrine was, you were you know, psychologically just destroyed. And so it really put you in a position of saying, okay, fine, I'm not going there. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to have this happen to me. You know, so. Two, two questions. Mm -hmm. You said um, that you didn't have very many other African American girls in your classes. Was this an all girls school? It was an all girls school. It was an all girls school. Now, going back to the inference that was made, but not spoken over here. Okay, later on, because of the fact of the oppression that the girls who kind of experienced, Afterwards, after school, they went wild. <laughs> <laughs> so they were the wild girls. They were the wild girls. girls going wild at school. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and all the guys would soon as. I wasn't a part of that. I was just there. <laughs> the guys would say, hey man, where are you going today? Man, we're going to Connie. Connie. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you know they they, they they line up. I mean, you know, it was, it was they, like they lined. They had cars lined up outside Kennedy, and they had the principal was standing out there with the major, with the chief custodian, taking down license plates because in order for you to get in the car with anyone, you had to have your license, a new letter with uh, a license plate, whoever was you were going to ride with. Well, I found out years later that one of the reasons why they did that was one of the um, I think it was called. Red Light Man, I can't remember. Mm, I can't remember that. Okay, yeah. he, one of his last almost victims was a comedy girl. Oh, and he was someone who was like, you know, you know what, like pursued after school. Mm -hmm. So they had this very strict thing about, you know, wanting to, to, to have a documentation of who what you were going to ride home. Well, anyway, so you, you know, you had to have your skirt a certain length, and you had to kneel down and make sure your skirt basically covered your knees, and if you didn't, you would like have to go, you know, you were given, you know, a warning and admonishment that you basically had to get your act together for the next day when you show up to school. Which meant that after school, everybody rolled their skirts up <laughs> so they could look like, you know, contemporary girls, right? But anyway, so, you know, that was some sort of a common, you know, experience. It was, um, um, you know, I, you know, I think it molded you in a way, but at the same time, it really, you know, just suppressed did not get a chance to explore your own creativity. I think the only thing that really I was able to do was write for, for um, the, the school newspaper for my last year of mm -hmm. high school. 
Council. And um, Alta County, really the only, the only, only school I ever wanted to go to was UCLA. Mm -hmm. Because we had visited there, I think it was in my junior year, my sister and mother and I. And uh, while I had lived closer to USC, I never really had an interest in USC. It was always UCLA. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, you know, when I first, I, I got married very really young. Very young, and I was going to college when I had to. Mm -hmm. Also, I had a child that was at this point. And UCLA, um, for me, was a very interesting experience because it was, I felt it was in my college education afforded me the opportunity of exposure. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it was about. It was about exposure. Um, I majored in. Communication. Well, first I started off majoring in, in sociology, undeclared. Then I, I was going towards uh, psychology. Okay, and that was also undeclared. And that changed when they started changing the, the requirements of psychology. When they started, they had so many people with psychology majors. They started making it harder for you to become a psychology major. And so they started infusing a lot of mathematical and statistical classes. And I said, you know what? That's just not my cup of tea. So I said, okay, fine. I'm going to be What year was it when you started UCLA? It was like 72. It was about 72. And I was, you know, I, I took psychology classes and I was really very fortunate to have um, uh, experienced some of the first black psychologists who had gotten PhDs from UCLA. Mm -hmm. And um, their classes were very eye opening because it used to put you back into the community. You know? And from that, I wanted to be. Center, which was, uh, it was an adjunct to which was Central, Central City Community Health Center, but it was basically a storefront facility. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that you know, a couple of people who were uh, through that experience were also going to, you know, to UCLA too. And um, well, I eventually declared my major as communication studies because my independent major, though it has you know, very, very clear courses, a very clear path. You know, I was not allowed you know, to go that way, so I just majored in communication studies. And what do you mean? You mean to, you weren't allowed to go that way? You mean well, that? we had to have yeah, your proposal had to be approved. Ah. You know, and one of my advisors says, I really can't understand why they didn't approve it. You know, I just had my own feelings about why that was. Anyway, so I wound up taking classes over in the film department. Okay, I took uh, the first class was a ethnographic video class, and the instructors. Um, Mark McCarty and, and uh, Norman, I can't remember his first name, but they taught um, a video class through a facility we had in the trailer in Topanga Canada mm -hmm. because it was a cable station in Topanga Canada. And what the, the class was supposed to do was take a look at some aspect of life in Topanga Canada and document it. Okay, and we were very happy for that you just considered the class. So that was you know, how I started working in video. And before that, I'd also have taken photography classes in UCLA too, which was, uh, again, another you know, very, uh, very important experience to me in terms of understanding photography, understanding you know, just you know, the elements of you know, basic photographic art and how I could be translated into cinematic art. And it was really interesting because I wanted to ask you, you also said that you had a dance background too? Well, I, that's what I wanted to do too. I wanted to, you know, I didn't, I never had formal training other than what I experienced in UCLA. But what I experienced in UCLA basically was a beginning, I think, for me to really open up creatively, you know, and taking dance classes. But I think the last program I could get, the dance program we spent so many years with people who were really, um, really very, um, uh, very I um, also took dance classes there in the summer times, and I think on Saturdays while I was in high school. And there was a woman there named Penny who was teaching classes. I forgot her name now, but she she runs. Um, she's in New York now, and um, those grants that you get. Um, 
It's on my resume. I got one of the grants one time. Um, it's called. I miss the grant. Nika. Oh, okay. Nika. She taught dance at UCLA. Probably when you were there, you know, because we're more or less the same age. Um, and now she runs NIFA. Oh, okay. Her name is Penny. Yeah, I didn't go to Harvard. I was taking dance with my majors. You know, yeah, so and me yeah, too. So, oh, okay. But it was, uh, it was like, a, as a people sort of a way of opening up for me. You know? And then, and then um, I wound up taking the criticism classes. Um, I wound up taking the very well cinema classes, which was very, you know, completely eye opening for me. Who was teaching? Alicia Taylor. Okay, and then eventually I wound up taking this uh, uh, class, a series of classes uh, that uh, Tishomi Gabriel was teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the first time I'd ever seen a film that had, other than, let's say, uh, oh, what is it? Oh, I'm trying to think of it. The Hollywood films from the 40s that had black stars in them. You know, um, Captain in the Sky. Exactly, Captain in the Sky and those ones. It was the first time I ever seen a film that was done. Some of those in that was as many as any of these films. Oh, and that just like, oh, you know, gosh, really, right, right, right. really right. blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like so high mm -hmm. uh, And then from there, you know, there's the understanding the history of the Oscar the show and mm -hmm. Spencer Williams mm -hmm. and all those people, you know, you know they had existed and they had 63 back in the 20s mm -hmm. and were doing works. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just, you know, pretty amazing. But well, what those classes did for me also was um, put me in contact with other, you know, other you know, students. But, I need to go back a little bit because when I first started film school at UCLA, um, my instructor from my days of doing the, uh, the video project in Japan Canyon, Mark McCartney, had said, you know what, if you're interested in film, I think you really agree with this. I think, you know, I'll write you another recommendation if you want to do it, if you're interested in doing this. I said, really? You know, so I applied and I was accepted. And it was so interesting because when I got accepted at film school in UCLA, the African-American male filmmakers who had been there for years were not leaving. Okay? At the time when I was in film school in UCLA, you could basically stay as long as you wanted to because everything you did was from your own pocket and to make you know, films, it was very expensive. It was and it's very expensive you know, media. So they were leaving. You know, so you had Charles Burnett, you had Larry Clark, you had Caldwell, you had Jim um, Akinaka, you, know, you had uh, all these people who were like exiting. But at the same time, the year I got in, we had seven African American women who were Carol Perry Blue, Judy Dash, um, we had, uh, well, Cheryl Lee Larkin was already there, Mildred um, Richard was already there, Okuli um, Layo, um, I don't think of who else, um, or Lavana Ballinger, you know, Karen Diaz was still associated with you know, the department, and Stormy Bright, oh goodness, Denise Bean. Jones. It was just, you know, there some a couple, you know, some of those women were already there, but then you have this influx. So it's almost like to me, like, okay, fine, we gotta have this double minority, you know, you know, this, you know, these people women can feel bring in the women to the department, bring in the African American to the department. And then there are also Latino women who were there too, like Francis Espana and Sylvia Morales, and uh, oh goodness, you know, you know, some some of them whose names I can't remember right now. It was really interesting because, you know, we would have all women crew essentially. You know, mm -hmm. we would we would have to like check out the equipment and basically, you know, our thing was we can be as organized as possible. We're gonna check out every piece of equipment because I worked on one of the shoots where basically you go to shoot and something is not working, so let's take everything out of the boxes, let's take and rewrap everything, make sure it was, you know, all ready and we're technic it's technically capable, you know, as possible given the limitations of the UCLA equipment, even though there was a lot of equipment in UCLA, which is why people stayed there so long, which is why I was there so long. And, um, and what year was this when all these women? This was like 77, 78. Was Donna Munch in there? Did, we, did she come back? Her? I know Donna was at, at AFI. AFI. And, okay. and Judy Dash had been at the AFI. Um, she was a city college in New York, and she was at AFI, and she was at UCLA. And so we had, you know, somehow all of them sort of connected. And you wound up working on each other's you know, projects. You know? Um, you know what I want to do? Um, I'll see how everybody else feels. Um, I'm kind of running out of time with your segment, but I think this is a good place to kind of, you can have a few more words and then keep that thought 
and when we get to your first early works, you can continue with, okay, sure. you know, these discussions. Is that how does that sound? Does that sound good to you guys too? Sure. It, yeah, it sounds great. I mean, actually, it sounds like she got to the, the good, the breakout point when you're right. matriculating, right? right. And then right. making actually making the film. So because I just want to make sure that we get to to sure. everybody. But if you want to have a, a last word, I don't want to cut no, you off no, cold. No, this is fine. <laughs> this, no, this is a, this is a good center. But I just want to mention that at, at UCLA, you know, one of my my main mentors was Shirley Clark, oh, and right. uh, it was Shirley Clark and Mark McCarty and Ed Brokaw. But uh, primarily it was Mark and, and Shirley, and that was a whole other experience. Shirley was absolutely great because she gave you the freedom, and Mark did also. You know, it's like if I get you stuck, it's okay, fine, go do more. You know, you couldn't have much more support than that. Mm -hmm. Would you like to go? Listen, you I, have a question. Yeah, no. Well, my, it's not even a question. I I gotta go to the restroom, so I okay. I'm gonna make a quick dash, and I'll be back. Okay. Okay, yeah. Well, wait a minute. You're going to talk about these more than Yeah, it's okay, man. Oh, yeah. it's okay? Yeah. What if you're uh, something that you. No, he misses it then. I'll ask you for a flashback later. I'm missing it. Right. Well, it's really interesting hearing another okay. side of everybody, you know, filling in some of the blanks. Yeah. I was, uh, sounds like an old blues song, but I was born in Chicago, uh, <laughs> Cook County uh, Hospital. And uh, um, my name at birth uh, was Sue Ellen Irons, which I changed. <laughs> and I, I was at an opening, uh, you know, in Philadelphia, and someone <laughs> came and whispered in my ear, he said, I know a secret. I said, what? He says, Sue, and I went, uh oh, where is it? You know, that placed him in a certain time frame. But uh, anyway. Um, Are you going to tell us what year you were born? Oh, sure. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, 1943. And um, I was born to uh, Eloise Lillian Irons and Samuel Irons. Um, my father died when I was three. And uh, he died of Hodgkin's disease, but also tuberculosis, because in those days, um, you know, if you were in a hospital and you were black, they just threw you. They put you anywhere, you know, <laughs> they put whatever. You tuberculosis <laughs> exactly, oh exactly. God. So, you know, as a child, I constantly had to have TB tests, which were always okay. And um, in 1951, we moved to Los Angeles, actually moved to Pasadena, and I love Pasadena. In uh, Chicago, much like uh, New Orleans, uh, most of the black children went to Catholic schools because the public schools were so terrible. And so I went to a Catholic school, and uh, I think it was the Holy Name of Mary, which is generic <laughs> Catholic school. But I loved it. I just loved the smell of the incense. I loved. Um, <laughs> The, the nuns with their long habits. And uh, there was just something, even at that age, it was very, I, I just was taken by the ritual of Catholicism. And I had to go to the catechism and all that. You weren't raised Catholic, though. No, actually, we were AME. But you had to say you were Catholic. So, <laughs> so I had to go through catechism and you know all that action. And so uh, we moved to LA, my mother and myself, and uh, she wanted to put me in a Catholic school in Pasadena, basically. And so that was my first thing with racism because they wouldn't let us in. Wow. So uh, I had to go to a public school. And uh, then we would kind of move back and forth between Los Angeles and Pasadena. And um, excuse me, what, what did they say the reason? Or, you were I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but that was clearly the reason right. um, because it was in near around Orange Grove. And, you know. I think that's an important point to make. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, let me ask you, why did you move from Chicago? Why did you, you and your mom move? Yeah, from because she wanted a better life and. Um, like you were talking about your family, you know, there were family dynamics, you know, she was very laid back and, you know, 
very visionary actually. And so, you know, Chicago is Chicago. <laughs> and so she wanted to get away from that experience. So um, we moved there. Um, I think it, we went to, I went to Lincoln Avenue Elementary School in Pasadena, and then we moved to LA. And I went to Adams Elementary School, which was at um, Western, uh, it was at, you know that? Okay, it's at Adams, it's not too far from where your house is. Adams and Western, I believe. Where the no, 24th no. Street School? Hmm? Was it 24th Street School? Is it no, no. Hmm. I'm trying to remember. It was in, the, you know, it was near the Adams and Western area, but it was further. Like yeah, uh, yeah, it was closer to, no, it was Adams Elementary. It was closer to um, uh, UC, uh, USC. And, you know, that experience was very multicultural, you know, Korean, uh, Hispanic, black, a few whites, but it was uh, Chinese, very multicultural. And um, so I kind of stuck in that area, you know, a lot of my life. And I loved that area a lot. It was near, um, what's that, a Catholic church? No, St. John, St. John. It's on Vermont. And Vermont and Adams. Vermont and Adams. Yeah. 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 Okay. They tore that place down. Oh, they did. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of architecture. There's a lot going on in that area. Um, then I went to uh, the worst junior high school in the entire <laughs> United States. <laughs> <laughs> O'Shea Junior oh, High. Oh, <laughs> Oh, my God. Still now. Huh? Still now. Yeah, it's rough. It was rough. I'm telling you, every day I was happy that I lived in the, <laughs> you know, going to that junior high school. And then, um, oh, speaking of the dance situation, uh, I, too, had early experiences. Uh, I went to ballet. I don't know how old I was, but it was in... Uh, around Melrose Boulevard, which is also where uh, Lester Horton's studio mm -hmm. ultimately was. And I had this uh, Russian ballet teacher, this <laughs> mistress, you know. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> you know pow, pow, pow. And here I'm this little chubby black girl, you know, trying to hang in there. But I love dance even then, I don't know why. And uh, so um, then I went to um, Dorsey high school. Hmm. And Dorsey, uh, Marin went to LA, and Dorsey and LA were kind of like right, middle right. class, yeah. yeah. And uh, and I also relate to Barbara's experience about the counselors, because clearly during that time, um, they would guide you in very incorrect ways. There was a girl who's a mixed, uh, but she could pass for white. And they told her not to hang out with us, not to hang out with any black people. And really, they did. And she refused, of course. But uh, they said, if you want to go to college, if you want to do this, if you want to do that, you know, don't. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, you know, I couldn't believe that a white counselor, but this was not unusual, that these counselors would just guide you and Worst I did the possible. same thing at LA High. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, and they told you that? Well, they didn't tell me that, but in general, oh, yeah. they were not helpful. No, no. Oh, but I mean to say, but to say, hang out with uh, oh, white yeah. people so that you could get ahead. Don't hang out with black people. Yeah. They actually uh, tell you that. No, but they didn't. Uh, they didn't put you in in advanced classes, for right. example. Right. There was like no real support. Yeah. Right. Right. No, but I was thinking about. The yeah. They yeah. actually tell somebody they to pass. Oh, yeah. You know, they basically. Did. That's all they did. And at my time in, in Dorsey, that's when things were kind of shifting a bit. And what, was, and what time was, are we talking about here? Uh, it was 1957, I think. Oh, okay. And it, it was like a little bit later than that. Yeah, okay. 58, 59, 59, 59, I'm sorry. So you're saying that you started around 59? Yes, I started around 59. And so there was like this shift happening. It was an all-white school, and then it started shifting, you know, to Asian, black, and so on. 
and you had to have um, an address to get in there. You had to live in Lamert Park, you know, because that's in the, and so we didn't live in Lamert Park, but we, of course, had an address that we used, so I was able to go. And it was such a, a, a stark difference between Fauché and the educational right. aspect of it, because in, at Dor I did have a few really wonderful teachers at, uh, uh, black teachers actually at Poche, but then they would like throw tomatoes at the, I mean, right. yeah. it was rough. Everybody was desperate. Yeah, they, they, I mean, you, the teachers could barely get out alive. I mean, you know, it was, it was terrible. It was, yeah. So anyway, so Dorsey was unbelievably different. The, the courses I took at Dorsey were actually harder than some of the courses that I took in college. I mean, they were, you know, just A plus teachers. But then as the, the, uh, the population changed, shifted. some of those teachers, yes, yeah, shifted out of there. But there were, the interesting thing was Dorsey was set up like a pie, a half of a pie, and they had triangles. And they had the senior triangle, they had the multicultural triangle, and then they had the black triangle, or they had the white triangle. And so the black triangle, it was, it was just wonderful because the brothers used to come with attache cases. <laughs> they used to wear suits to school, and, um, it had a very strong um, sorority and fraternity base at the school. And so they, the brothers would have like these whooping sessions. And, <laughs> are you familiar with that? Oh school? yeah. And so they wouldn't let any of us girls around. We had to be like, you know, on the side. And they'd get in a circle, incredibly tribal, get in a circle, and then they started playing the dozens. And they would talk about each other's mamas. And, Every time someone would, you know, just get way, you know, messed up, then they'd have to leave. And then it would get smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is what would happen, you know, 